Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. Before we get started with the meat of the video, I wanted to chat about a couple things. First off, I want to thank everyone who commented on my last few videos about how my video and audio quality has improved greatly. I'm using my new Panasonic camera, but I'm still learning how to use it. So please excuse any issues with focus or exposure because there's a lot of options on this thing. My old camera was pretty much a point and shoot camera. So you didn't have to do very much to get it to work well. The new one has a million configurable options on it and I still haven't figured out exactly how to configure all the options. So I'm getting there and the video quality should improve as we go. For audio quality, I'm currently using a wired microphone to the camera. You might notice it clipped on my shirt in some shots. I apologize in advance for when I rub on this microphone and it makes noise, I need to remember not to do that. But to improve audio quality even further, I've switched to new editing software. I used to use PowerDirector, I think version 16. That program was good and I knew how to use it, but had some really limited functions on it and some really annoying bugs. I've switched to DaVinci Resolve, which has really powerful audio processing capabilities. It really allows me to properly apply vocal processing and noise reduction to the audio signal, which should really help improve audio quality. Next, I wanted to say hello to all my viewers that show up at the Commodore Computer Club monthly meetings here in the Portland area. The December meeting, which we just had, was an absolute blast. What a great turnout. So many nice people and fun machines to play with. And I wanted to specifically say hi to Cal, one of my viewers who showed up at the meeting for the first time ever. If you'd like to know more about the meetings, like where they are and when they happen, I'll put a link in the description below. Check that out. But the short version is, it happens on the first Friday of every month up in Vancouver, Washington. It's free to come. And if I'm in town and available, I'm definitely there. I try to go every single time. So we can kind of call it the unofficial Adrian's Digital Basement meetup that happens once a month here in the Portland area. So speaking of the meetings, there's actually something under the tree, which I picked up last night at the meeting that I'd like to show everyone. Here's the first thing I got, and it's kind of like a little present. There's actually a little tag on here and it says from Corey to Adrian. And you know what it is? It's a pack of Commodore 64 RF shields. We have a lot of laughs at the club meetings because everyone knows how much I really hate RF shields and that I always take them off machines and throw them in the trash. So they've more than once given me a stack of RF shields to take home because they know how much I love these and they know that I love to throw them away and that makes some of my viewers really angry. So apologies to my viewers, I hate that I throw them away, but sorry, that's just what I do and you can choose to keep your RF shields if you like. There's one more thing under the tree, let me grab it and it's an Apple IIc. At every club meeting, there's a table full of parts that are there for sale and trade that various members bring in. And Corey, the same person who gave me the RF shields, had a bunch of Apple IIcs available. Well, I had brought in some old CRT monitors that I wanted to sell, and I was able to get rid of those, and with that cash, I was able to buy this Apple IIc. So some of you may know that I already have a IIc if you watch some of my restoration videos on that. And the IIc was a machine I had as a kid, so it holds a real special place in my heart. But what's special about this 2C versus the one I have is yes, it's very yellow and it also doesn't work, but it has the Alps keyboard. And the Alps keyboard has orange key switches on it and feels absolutely so nice. Tactile switches, smooth operation. Compared to the keyboard that's very common on these and the one that's on my other 2C, this thing types like a dream. So even though this machine doesn't work, I'm gonna switch this keyboard with the keyboard in my other machine, and then this will make a fun repair video. So look for that in an upcoming video. All right, and now finally to the meat of this video. Today, we're gonna to be taking a close look at the Compaq Desk Pro, the very first desktop computer that Compaq ever made. Let's get right to it. So this is the Compaq Desk Pro. It's the first desktop computer that Compaq ever made. Their actual first computer was the Compaq Portable, but this was released soon after for people who wanted a little less portability and a little bit more expandability. I luckily found this entire setup, including the matching monochrome amber monitor at the local Free Geek here in Portland. This system here was clearly love as it's expanded with two different floppy drives. 
and it appears to have a hard drive in it as well. When I got this computer, I didn't actually have the keyboard, but Earl from the Retro Roundtable podcast donated some stuff to me, including the matching keyboard for this machine. I haven't spent a lot of time with this machine yet, so we'll be looking at it together to see what kind of condition it's in on the inside and if it actually works at all. As was the case with probably a lot of these machines from back in the day, it was rather expensive and was probably used in an office environment and henceforth has this sticker from Able Office Machines. And interesting is this address is actually pretty close to where I live now. But as with all things in Portland, especially on Division, there's been some massive changes there where most of the old businesses and things that were on Division have been replaced by new style apartment buildings and restaurants and shops. So this is what is now at that address of 3249 and it's just yet another one of these apartment buildings. Oh, my heat just turned on, so this will be a good test of my new microphone and noise cancellation to see how loud it is compared to my old camera. This is the included keyboard for the machine. If it's anything like the compact portable, it's a foam and foil keyboard, which means that the foam degrades over time, rendering the keyboard completely inoperative. This one feels pretty good, not mushy at all. So this might not be foam and foil. Hopefully this is some kind of rubber dome or slider design. On the back, Compact Computer Corporations, based out of Houston, Texas. Here's the model of the Compact Despro keyboard. This was their first external keyboard. So no fancy model numbers here. A lot of this computer is extremely yellowed. And I'm wondering what the original plastic color was, that if anything, that is about the original color of the plastic trims on this machine. So I can use that as sort of a comparison to see how much I need to retrobrite everything. Otherwise, everything's pretty run of the mill. It's got these bumpers here that help it slide on the table. Although there's only two rubber feet on the front edge and I guess the back people were gonna be using these stands. The rubber cord, very stretched out. So I'm gonna to have to try some methods on trying to restore this. If anyone has any recommendations, I'd love to hear it. I have never tried anything myself. Although I've heard stories about wrapping this around a little bit of a pole and putting this in your oven at a low temperature and letting it bake and that kind of restores the shape. The monitor is in pretty good shape. It's got a brightness knob on the front. Clearly it's got an amber CRT. Although I have to wonder, because this is such an amber color, perhaps this is actually a black and white phosphor, like a white phosphor with some type of an amber glass coating on the top. It's definitely glass and not plastic. If you know any info about why this looks amber, I'd love to hear it. I have other amber monitors and they definitely don't have this look while the computer is off. Monitor has an interesting wedge shape here. It's quite a lot of yellowing on the side and on the top, so I'll have to do a little bit of restoration there. And on the back, we have quite a lot of yellowing again. This was probably backwards towards a window perhaps. And from a cord perspective, both the power cord and the signal cable are permanently attached to the monitor. It has a standard DB9 connector here, probably a monochrome signal. But interesting is the power signal has three pin DIN connector. We'll take a look at the voltages that are coming out of the computer, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is just five and 12 volts or perhaps it's 12 and 12 and ground. And on the back of the monitor, it's just Compact Computer Corporation, again in Houston, Texas. And the model is Compact Deskbro DSM. So right here on the monitor, it says that this monitor was manufactured in January, 1987. That's quite late, actually. The Deskbro was first released in June of 1984. We take a look at the bottom of this. Ah, uh, there's the original plastic color of the monitor. And wow, it nearly matches the color of the metal of the computer itself. That means I got a lot of retro writing to do. Let's take a closer look at the Desk Pro itself. First off, this machine is incredibly heavy. This is definitely heavier than the IBM 5150 and 5160s and also the 5170. This thing is a tank. On the front of the machine, we have the keyboard connection. So different than the IBM in that it's not on the back. Then there's a power LED, I presume. We have the first floppy drive bay, which probably on the original 1984 models had a full height drive here. And there's a second bay, which probably had a second full height drive originally. And now, of course, this has a hard drive in it with a probably a blank plate of sorts up here. Someone has clearly upgraded this machine along the way because these two floppy drives don't match. What's interesting to me is the little bit of a rubber surround that's around these bays is actually a rubber texture. 
But I wonder what that's all about. Maybe that's something to allow it to seal dust better. Both sides of the machine are just blank, solid metal. Unlike an IBM, there's no clunky power switch right here. All right, in the back of the machine, we have the clunkin' power switch right here on the back with the IEC input. And then we have the expansion slots over here on the side. We have one through eight. So interesting that it has eight expansion slots. Here is a, a DIN connector, which is clearly for the monitor. And we're getting a little bit of an idea of what's in this machine here. This looks like a printer port of types. This is clearly the video port, but also a composite video output. And someone at some point has installed a modem in this machine. And if we look at the slot covers, these are probably the original ones, but this card and this card look like they maybe have been replaced at some point. On the original compact portable, it also had an internal monitor that supported both monochrome and CGA resolutions. And I'm wondering now if they use the same multi-format card in the Desk Pro and that that external monitor I have does CGA kind of shades of gray in addition to monochrome. So we'll have to test that. Here's the Compact Desk Pro label and the serial number. Don't know how to decode this, so I couldn't tell you where on the line of manufacturing this machine was. Kind of nice is the IEC connector has a built-in fuse holder right here and it has a four amp fuse inside. All right, let's crack open the computer. Oh, you know what? In typical compact fashion, it's using Torx screws. All right, I have my little set of bits and I wouldn't be surprised if this is a T15. Yep, T15. All right, I think these screws are out. Ah, yes, this just slides forward. Ooh. That is dusty. This machine has some serious dust on the inside. It was very well used, probably was in service for quite a long time and got a lot of use before it was taken out of service. Look at this flap. If we flip this up, we can see that I was right and there was a card installed right here. This card here, which looked like the printer card is also the floppy and actually it says floppy printer card right there. And then what's here, this little card on the end is the hard drive controller and it's a much later Taiwanese type card kind of stuck in there. It's very nice of Compaq. They did this for a long time as they include the jumper and switch settings for the machine. And it looks like this computer supports up to 640K. Here's something interesting. We're looking at the right side of the machine and you can see there's a Seagate hard drive installed in the drive bay here. And look at this black thing underneath. And you know what it is? It's rubber mounts for this entire chassis. And that probably explains why there was rubber around this part because the entire drive chassis is shock isolated on this rubber big plate here. Why did they do that? The rubber in these isolation mounts is probably a bit worn out. So this probably doesn't move as much as it did when it was new. But this entire drive cage seems to be free floating. It's something I've never seen inside a PC before. I took the computer outside and I used my air compressor to blow some air through it. And let's just say a lot of dust came out, but now it's actually clean. Well, at least it's cleaner. <laughs> now I've done very little research on this machine and I'm really curious to know how much RAM is installed in it. And looking here, I have a feeling this has probably got a full 640K. These chips here are 256K, so eight of them makes 256K, or nine if you have a parity chip. So this is 512K right here. These chips here are 41,464. And if I'm correct, two of these make 64K, and four of these, which you see right here, is 128K. So right there, that tells us that 512K plus 128K for these four chips equals a total of 640K. All right, enough fooling around. I think it's time to test this out. And let's place the keyboard right here. Plug this into the front keyboard connection. There it is. Here we go, everyone. We have a flashing cursor. Let me turn these lights off so you guys can see a little better. Okay, error code 601. Well, look at that, Seagate. <laughs> it's booting. Hard drive sounds a little worse for wear. Not so happy. Good old Seagate, probably a 251 there or 225. The power LED is red and I thought that was green when it first turned on. Seek error, Han Drive D. Let's just fail that. Oh, nice. 
The no slot clock. That's interesting. The no slot clocks. These are little clock chips that plug right into the motherboard in one of the ROM sockets. Sits underneath a system ROM and then it's able to set the time, time and date that way. Let's see, did it actually retain any time and date? 2019? Are you kidding me? So it's a little bit off. It's at around December 7th or 8th, I think. And so it's not November, but that's amazing that this computer has a working clock. DIR, DOS 5.0. Is that what's on here? It is. So this thing was used relatively late there's a date on auto exec here from 1992 and command com is 1991. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, auto exec bat 1994. So yeah, kind of cool that the keyboard is actually working. I'll have to run check it on here to see if it's actually working all the different keys. Let's look if there's a mem command on here. Uh, hard drive is not super happy. Data error on drive D. Why is it going to D again? Let's check out this mythical D drive, see if I can even do a directory listing on it. Okay, it's actually doing a directory. So there's just people's files on here, resume and things on this machine. Probably these are WordPerfect documents. This thing was just probably used for word processing. All right, let's run some diagnostics on this machine and copy some of these files off the hard drive, whatever I can get off here. And to make that easier and facilitate that, I have an XT IDE card. If you remember my Tandy 1000 video, these particular compact flashcards don't seem to work well in 8088 class machines. So I'm going to put this in here and we're going to find out what happens. But I'm not holding out hope that this is going to boot properly in this machine. But before I install the card, let's spray some deoxit into the 8-bit slot. I'm going to use this one right here. All right. And let's just pop this card in here. Just get that in like this. Still getting that 601 error code. Ah, oh, but there's the XTID BIOS, sweet! Four gigabytes, scene. See if we can run the boot menu here, F2. So the original hard drive, these foreign hard drives is 80 and 81. We're gonna try to boot off 82, which is my compact flash card, which is the E drive. Let's see what happens. And the computer froze. I am pretty sure that this is the compact flash card causing this problem, so it's time to get a different one. Okay, so I'm preparing the compact flash card on my Windows 10 machine. So I'm gonna boot this machine up again so I can clean the floppy drives. I have a cleaning floppy and 99% alcohol. I bought this off eBay and it came with both the five and a quarter inch one and the three and a half inch disc. All right, we're at the C prompt. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take some of this IPA, put that on there and we're gonna slide this into the top drive. I don't know which is which, so let's just try B as the bottom drive. All right, so that didn't do anything at all. So let's try A drive. And e drive is not spinning either. So neither of these drives seem to be working at all. I think at this point, the easiest thing to do is get out one of my spare floppy drives and we're gonna plug that into this computer. We're gonna totally bypass these drives and I'll work on these later. So I can see right here, this is the floppy cable and the top drive is actually the A drive because it's got the twist. And I can see that it is actually the B drive or rather, it's the A drive. What is going on? What is all this extra stuff? That's so strange. There's actually three floppy drive connections. So this top connector here, this had the twist in it. And actually, this second one is back to straight through. And then there's an extra cable on the end, an extra connector on the end that's also straight through. Maybe this was for one of those tape drives. And let's unplug these power connectors from these drives. There's actually a splitter cable that goes to the hard drive. And the weird thing is, is that this cable here, this uh, cable with the red and the yellow and the black goes to the motherboard. But the other drive, the other floppy drive had this connector on it. And this was actually connected to the power supply directly. Here's a spare 360K drive. I'm gonna just use this power connector that goes to the power supply directly. This connector here is the twist part. I'm gonna put that on. And now that I think about it, that 601 error we were seeing, that's the floppy drive seek error code. So maybe this uh, floppy controller is actually bad. So let's see if this works and maybe I'll reseat this, this floppy controller if this is still not working. I still had a 601 error code, sorry that, that disappeared. So it's definitely the floppy drives aren't working. So let's test for 12 volts on the floppy drive. We'll just check to make sure that these power rails are good. 12.37 volts there and the five volt rail 
5.07. So we're looking good on the power rails. It's not a problem with voltage there. So let's take this controller out and take a quick look at it. So there it is. That is the compact floppy printer port adapter board. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do just quickly and easily is I'm gonna deox it the, the connector down there. Although this looks pretty clean. I don't really see any corrosion whatsoever on these fingers. So we'll get some deox it down in there. I'm gonna plug that in. I'm gonna deox it the floppy connector as well. Actually, just looking at this floppy drive here, this is set for DS0, which is incorrect. I must have been using this on a Tandy or something else. Okay, we'll turn this back on. We need to watch for that 601 error again. Okay, we didn't get the 601 error, although I didn't really hear the floppy drive seek, but it's quite possible that this BIOS doesn't seek the floppy that way. Hard drive is really having a hard time making weird seek noises, but you know what? I'm gonna run a couple utilities on it. Seems to be working otherwise. It just probably has some bad sectors on it over time. All right, I have a formatted 360K floppy disk. Let's insert this into this drive. And let's take a look at A. It's spinning. Oh, not so good though. It appears to be trying to access the drive, but the heads aren't moving at all. Now that I think about it, there's a possibility this drive doesn't work either. I can't really remember if this is known working. Okay, so because this is acting weird, I'm gonna take a three and a half inch drive and connect that to this with a different cable. All right, let's power this up again. I got a 720K disc here with DOS 622 on it. Okay, see the floppy drive light is just solid on. That would indicate I have the cable flipped over backwards and flip the cable around. That's what happens when you put the floppy cable on backwards. And unfortunately, I had the red stripe towards the power connector but that is not always the way you go towards pin one. And this is a chin on drive, and I guess it's backwards. There we go, no, no floppy light solid on. Okay, so it accessed the floppy drive briefly. Well, let's see what happens. A, okay, we got an A prompt, DIR. Oh, maybe, ah, general failure. I gotta say that I think this floppy controller is bad. This, this floppy drive definitely works. Oh, wait a second. It's reading this one okay. Okay, what just happened there? Now it had a bunch of garbage. Something is very flaky. This this card has got to be not working properly. All right, so <laughs> I wasn't having any luck, so I switched to a different floppy drive. I really can't believe all my drives are not working correctly. Uh, this has got to be a bad floppy controller, but let's just see. I just want to get this thing booted one time off this disk so that we can sys the compact flash and it will make testing all this stuff so much easier. Okay, we didn't get the 601, so that's a good sign. Spinning the disc, the green light is on. Yeah, and we're getting nothing. And you know what? I haven't heard a single thing on any of these drives. I, hadn't, I haven't heard drive seek. So the seeking signaling on this controller, it's got to be bad. All right, what I have here is a floppy controller, and this is one with a BIOS on it. So it actually can support 1.44 megabyte floppies, even on an old XT machine. So that's sort of a nice trick. Pop out this compact card here. That makes it easy. We'll use the same slot just in case that's where we're having a problem. Interesting, this is green, this power LED when we first turn the computer on. We just got a 401. So it says 1.44 meg floppy disk. This is the BIOS here of the floppy drive. Well, I just realized what I think I did wrong here. See, it's just hanging at the boot prompt. The disk I formatted, this was formatted on a Windows 98 machine and clearly Windows 98 DOS, which is the equivalent of what, DOS 7.0 or 7.1 or whatever. I don't think it works on XT class machines. So I have just reformatted this floppy with DOS 622. And this is a 1.4 meg disk, actually formatted as 1.44. Let's see if this boots. All right, we're getting 1.44. We hit A to boot the A disk. And this is normal, it takes a little bit of time with DOS 622 before it says starting MS DOS. Yeah, oh yes. This is great. Let's sys the compact flash card. We got MS DOS. Uh, I don't know what disk it's going to be, so let's just check these. DIR on the C. Uh, that's the hard drive. Maybe it's going to be E. Oh no, invalid spec. So only C is showing up. No D, no E, no F, G, H. Okay, so I have F disk on the floppy disk. Could be that I partitioned the compact flash card on my Windows 10 machine. That doesn't always work properly. Unable to access drive two. Oh, wow, look at this. Disk one is 20 megabytes, and the C drive is only two megabytes. 
That's a bit crazy. So here we go. This is the compact flash card right here, disc three. And let's look at the partition table for nothing. No partitions to find. All right. Well, let's create a primary DOS partition. It's going to should show us that it's about two gigabytes in size. Do you want to use the maximum? No. So yeah, it's 1900 megabytes. We are going to do it only as say 128 megabytes. Okay. 130 megabytes. That's fine. And we'll create another DOS partition on there. So we're going to create extended partition and we're going to make that the full size of the rest of the, the disk. But then you have to create logical partitions. So let's create a logical partition of 256 megabytes. And that's going to be the E drive. And we hit, so actually we're going to leave one here. We're going to make the last one. I'm just going to make it the full size, 1500 megabytes. So now all space is used. We're going to reboot and I'm going to format those partitions. All right, I have the exposure lock on. Sorry, I didn't have that on before. So the screen should be a little easier to see. So I am not sure what drive we need to format. So I'm afraid of accidentally erasing the Seagate drive. So I'm gonna remove its, the built-in controller card for it. So all we're gonna be left with is the XT IDE. So I know this feels a little disjointed so far this video, but sometimes when you have these old PCs, you're met with a whole bunch of different problems kind of all piled on top of each other. And you have to start eliminating things to try to troubleshoot. And that's one of the reasons why, like for instance, I hooked this floppy drive up as opposed to trying to get these drives working. And eventually it's just easier just to switch out the original floppy controller card. That way I am not potentially running into weird issues with it. Just we're gonna get to a known good configuration and then I can go back and start testing these things. So now all we have is the XT IDE in here. And if I format C slash S, this should format that 120 or 130 megabyte partition I made and the slash S installs the DOS 622 system onto it. And then we should be able to boot. I will then need to put that back into my Windows 10 computer and recopy all the programs and files I had on there. And this is a good learning experience. If you partition the compact flash card in a Windows 10 machine, it often does it in a way that is incompatible with DOS. And that's why when I put this in here and we did DIR on the C drive, it was, it couldn't even read it at all. It was completely blank. So at this point, when I put this card now back into that machine, it will show all these partitions because Windows 10 is compatible with these old DOS partitions. And then I can recopy all the programs and files onto this thing like DOS and all my diagnostics tools. And when I stick it back in here, it will absolutely boot. And as you see there, it says system transferred. And I'm just gonna quickly format the D and the E partition. So I have some extra space for copying games and whatever else. And there's the partition, the 257 megabyte one. And what I'm gonna do is one last thing before we reboot onto the compact flash card, just to make sure it's working, is I'm going to run F disk again, and I'm gonna check that the primary partition is an active partition, that the C drive is active. Because sometimes what happens is, because I partitioned the compact flash card, when it was in the machine with that other hard drive, DOS thinks, oh, this is not the primary boot partition, and it doesn't mark it as active. And look right here, just like I thought, no partitions are set to active, which means if we reboot on this card, it won't actually do anything. So all you have to do is hit set active partition. It's gonna ask you which one, it's gonna be the C drive. So we push one. Now it has an A right there under status and we are good to go. And it's gonna reboot the computer. So we're gonna take the floppy disk out and it's gonna detect the CF card. The hard drive is disconnected right now and this should boot right off the hard drive and there it is, MS-DOS. Sweet. And we do DIR. It's gonna be slow because XT class machines are very slow at counting up the free space, which is why you don't wanna make a single two gigabyte partition. It will take forever to count that up. Look how slow that was and that was just for 130 megabytes. Although the second time you do DIR, it's not so slow. So now we're ready to put this card back in my Windows 10 machine, copy all those programs and stuff back onto it. Okay, I've recopied everything onto the C drive on the compact flash card. So we'll just insert this back in here. We're gonna turn the machine back on. So the this thing just started making a very strange noise, uh, like a high pitched whine. And I'm not sure there was anything displaying on it. So there may be a fault in here, but this definitely kind of made a crack sound and then made a high pitched noise. So I'm gonna have to crack this open and we're gonna have to take a look at that as well. All right, booting C drive, MS-DOS. So we know this boots. There it is, okay, it's sweet, okay. <laughs> Obviously this isn't an IBM, but I had an IBM ANSI file on there. 
So let's go, oops, utils, check it, three, check it. Let's check out, check it. All right, well, this, this gives me some insight into what's going on with this monitor. First off, there is definitely burn-in going on. And you see, there are sort of lines here. I can see what looks like characters. So this monitor was in use for a very long time and it definitely has burn-in. What's also fascinating to me is while this looks like a monochrome MDA screen, it's not. And the reason why I say that is because a monochrome monitor has basically black, bright white, and dim white. Those are the colors that are possible to display on a monochrome screen. It doesn't have these shades of gray you have here. And you notice the check it is bright, but you see the check mark? That's a different brightness. And then you have this background here, and that's a different brightness again. And then you have different shades of text. So I think this is actually a monochrome monitor, but it's sort of interpreting color signals to be different shades of gray. Well, exit out of check it. And we're gonna go to CGA Comp, which is a CGA compatibility testing suite. This is really to test how compatible the particular card is you're using to the original CGA card from IBM. So let's take a look at the M6845 compatibility. So this is showing the refresh rate of the video card and true CGA is NTSC or 60 Hertz, just under 60 Hertz. But this monitor is actually running at 50 Hertz right now. And that is correct. That is exactly the refresh rate of the IBM monochrome standard. And we are in text mode right now. And I think the text mode absolutely is running at 50 Hertz because this is running in the higher resolution mode, but we'll try these different modes which should engage graphics. Yep, there we go. This is showing raster bars on a CGA card, which really is only possible if it's truly CGA compatible, and it is. Here we're looking at one of the pseudo 16 color graphics modes on CGAs. This is a pseudo graphics mode. It uses a text mode with some reprogramming to allow much smaller characters. And this is gonna test some smooth scrolling by adjusting the start of the video memory, although you get that weird shifting, but that's fine. That's just, this is just testing two different modes. One we're getting vertical scrolling, the next one is gonna be horizontal, and there it is, horizontal. So, because this runs at 50 hertz, this monitor, you do get quite a bit of ghosting, and that's because the phosphor is a long persistence. Otherwise, in 50 hertz, you'd get quite a flicker. And here is what I wanted to bring up. This is all 16 colors of CGA text mode displaying on this monochrome screen. And you can see there are actually differentiations between each of these shades, all the way from black to white. You get a nice gradation. And unlike a typical monochrome monitor where you have two knobs, one for contrast and one for brightness, this one only has a single knob which seems to control brightness only. Now I can tell one thing is this monitor is quite tired. So you see the burn in here with these lines, but when I turn this up to be a little brighter, you get a lot of blooming. You get a lot of the background, the blacks are kind of showing up as a gray now. So yeah, overall this, this CRT is, is not so great. I'd love to get my hands on something that just looks a little bit nicer than this to do a tube swap on this monitor. Yeah, this is a shame. It's just, very, very worn out, but I guess I'm glad I have the monitor anyways. So here we are back in Check It, and I just want to see the system configuration. So as we know, STOS 622, it shows up as compact. What's surprising to me is this is actually an 8086 and not an 8088. So both the 8088 and 8086 have the same number of address lines. So you get one megabyte of addressable memory, but the 8086 has 16 bit data bus versus eight. Now, I don't know what the benefit is exactly on a machine like this, because it still has 8-bit ISA slots. You're not getting more bits there. But I guess between the memory and the processor, you probably have higher throughput. Let's check out the benchmarks. And this is running at 477 megahertz. I was under the impression that this was actually faster than that. Although maybe there's a turbo mode that I can engage that will speed this up. So we have a little bit faster speed than the original XT, which run this is running at the same speed as that machine. And that's probably due to the faster memory bandwidth available due to the extra eight bits of data bus. I'm wondering now if this LED here is green when it's running in a turbo speed and red when it's running at the slower speed. This thing can't possibly just be 4.77 megahertz. 
there's got to be maybe a key combination or some way to switch this mode. So I've been doing some research on the Desk Pro, wondering how I control the turbo speed, for instance, and I found some interesting stuff. So on this paper here, it talks about the video resolution output, and you can actually toggle between the high resolution 80 by 25 and CGA by pushing Control Alt less than or Control Alt greater than. So let's just give this a quick test. So currently we're running in high resolution mode, but if I push Control Alt less than, you might be able to tell that the font is the CGA font. And then if I switch to Control Alt and the other greater than, now we're running in the high resolution mode. So that's kind of neat. You can switch on the fly between those two modes. And then we found some interesting stuff here. This is similar. It's talking about those same key combinations, but it also mentions keystrokes control all plus and control R minus control the obtrusiveness of the key click. Well, currently I don't hear any key click at all, but if I hit control all plus, now there's a click, listen. It's very subtle. And if I keep pushing control all plus, so that's neat on the fly you can control the keyboard click. It also says control alt backslash toggles the turbo mode. All right, we're running landmark CPU speed test 0.99. I found this on one of my old computers and it's a very old speed test program. So currently it says we're running at a 1.7 megahertz AT equivalent or a 1.0 times the speed of the PCXT. So this thing is exactly running at 4.77 megahertz. I push control all backslash. There we go. 2.2 times the speed of the original PCXT and 3.9 megahertz equivalent AT. And sure enough, the power LED is green now. And if I push control all backslash, slows down and it changes to a red LED. So the computer always seems to boot up in the slow speed whenever you boot up. But what's cool is on this documentation that I found, it says that the BIOS writes zero for slow speed or one to fast speed to the IO port CF. And we can do that ourselves using the debug command. So to write to an IO port, you push ZO for output. You type the IO port itself, which is CF. And then we're gonna write one for fast, eight megahertz. So if we push one, keep an eye on this LED here. And look at that, it's now green. So let's exit out and we'll run the speed 99, make sure the computer is actually running in fast speed. And sure enough, it is. So somewhere on the internet is probably utility that can put this in fast mode in your auto exec. But I searched high and low. I couldn't find a copy of the original discs for this thing, nor could I find such a utility. So I think I'm just gonna write utility to do this myself. So here's what I've come up with. In this directory, I have two files, fast.d and slow.d. And if we look at one of them, like fast.d, all it's doing is it's a list of commands for the debug command. So O, and we're gonna write to CF, and we're gonna send a one to it, and then Q for quit. And you can imagine that the slow one is the same, except it's writing zero. And the way we run this is we use debug, and we redirect the file, like fast.d, into it. And what that's gonna do is it actually just executes the commands. But if you wanna do that while it's silent, we just direct this to the device null, which is the equivalent like Linux or Unix slash dev slash null. And on DOS, it just won't output anything. And you can see it's currently running in the fast speed. And if I go and I change this to slow, I hit enter. It's now running in the slow speed. Back to fast. There we go. So it's a way to control whether or not this machine's in slow or fast. And I can just add this right into the auto exec back. According to the same paper, it, it says the keyboard beep or key click sound is stored at 0040,006A. And sure enough, that's this byte right here, and it's 00 when there is no key click, and it seems like there are seven levels of key click from 00 all the way to 07. And I set it for two, and I had it set it for the maximum click, which is right now. Let's see if we can write to this memory location and actually make the beep change. So we're gonna use E. 0040006A, and I'm gonna write 00 to it, which should turn off the key click. And it did, no more key click. And if I do that again, 
006A, and we're gonna write 07. Should have maximum key click. And we do! Oh, this is neat. And I kind of like the key click of actually one, which is just a very subtle tick sound. It's like a little, just a click tick. Keyboard's a bit mushy feeling. So the click just sort of, you know, turns it into a mechanical keyboard. Okay, not really, but still neat nonetheless. I've added my scripts to the auto exec bat. So fast speed engaged and key click enabled. Key clicks enabled and the computer's running at fast speed. So that's working. Thumbs up. Well, I think I'm gonna end this video here and call this part one of the Compact Desk Pro series. In part two, I'm gonna sort out the floppy drive situation. I'm gonna get the original MFM hard drive working again, and I'm gonna add some extra memory to this computer, probably a few other things as well. And then in part three, which will come later, I'll do a final cleanup of this machine and a retrobrite. As far as those debug scripts I created for this machine to control the turbo and the key click, I'm gonna add those to a link in the description below. So if you wanna download those for one of your compact machines, give it a try. If you try it on anything else besides a Desk Pro, I'd love to hear back and let me know if it works on those machines. I really wouldn't be surprised if those scripts work on other similar vintage compact machines. So if you found this video interesting in any way, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. You can give me a thumbs down. Subscribe for more videos. There'll be lots of those in the future. Hit that little bell icon if you wanna be notified when I do post new ones. Put your comments and your questions in the comment section below. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.